happy. And I uh, appreciate the invitation to do this. Um, so we're going to look into the cardiac complications for athletes after COVID-19. Uh, um, there's no disclosures. So when we think about cardiac complications associated with COVID-19, as you many of you are well aware and see this in the hospital day to day, um, our initial data came from hospitalized patients uh, early in the pandemic, uh, with anywhere up to about a quarter or, or slightly more of hospitalized patients showing evidence of cardiac injury. Uh, many of the studies that were done defining cardiac injury really suggested that a troponin greater than the 99th percentile uh, met that criteria. And the, 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 the troponin level tends to be higher in those underlying conditions, and, and the higher the level, the, the worse prognosis. Um, some of the data or some of the studies also included new ECG findings or, or abnormalities in echocardiogram as part of their definition for cardiac injury as well. Um, over the last few months, and, and you know, we, we've also noted or seen clear risk factors for having severe COVID-19 disease or increased risk of death, and those include diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and known cardiovascular disease. What about fitness level? How does that play a role into uh, as a risk factor or, or is it not a risk factor? So when we think about regular exercise, there's really good data um, that routine moderate aerobic exercise has, has consistently been shown to be beneficial for both the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, it also improves immune function, reduces low-grade inflammation, improves mental health, and lowers the risk of illness. So how does that play out for COVID-19? Found this interesting study from Mayo Clinic Proceedings that looked at is a retrospective investigation that looked at um, patients who had had previous stress testing and then a COVID-19 diagnosis. And so they had 246 subjects who had stress testing and, and the diagnosis, and 89 of those were hospitalized. And so they looked at their their peak exercise effort uh, prior to the illness and, and and their hospitalization rates. And so if you look at the graph here on the right. Um, peak METs on the bottom, you have men and women. The green is, is the lowest MET category, 5.4, and the yellow is the greatest, essentially greater than about 10, 10 METs. And you can see for both sexes, the hospitalization rate decreases significantly as, you, as, you, you know, as their fitness levels were higher. Um, and so the odds ratio for hospitalization for that lowest fitness quartile, the less, point, less than 5.4, was 3.88 compared to the high, highest fitness level. And so they concluded that there was an independent inverse association between the maximum exercise capacity and likelihood of hospitalization. So just another reason to encourage all of our patients and ourselves to exercise regularly. When we think about the mechanisms of cardiac injury with COVID-19, there's a host. Uh, we know obviously there's direct acute lung injury and, and ARDS, but the, the virus also can directly impact the heart through direct vir uh, viral myocyte invasion and myocarditis. And then there's multiple indirect mechanisms as well. Um, you have increase in the inflammatory markers, IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and that can create inflammatory-related injury. Um, you can get coronary plaque rupture or type 1 MIs. And, and then with the endothelial activation, um, you can also get the, the dysfunctional endothelium that become pro-adhesive and pro-thrombotic. Um, and then reports of stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. The one we're going to focus on for most of this talk is, is sort of most relevant for uh, endurance or competitive athletes is the myocarditis. This was a nice review written in Heart Rhythm in September um, that looks, it was a comment, uh, commentary or review specifically on COVID 19 related myocarditis. And so they looked at, or they defined a few things. One, myocarditis, inflammatory disease of the heart characterized by inflammatory infiltrates and myocardial injury without an ischemic cause. Viral myocarditis, the proposed mechanism is a combination of both direct cell injury and T lymphocyte mediated cytotoxicity. Um, as you're all aware, aware that the SARS-CoV-2 -CoV gains entry into the human cells by binding its spike protein, you can see in the bottom left figure, um, to the membrane protein ACE2, and that, that's after it's primed by the serum protease. Now, the ACE2 receptors are, are pretty prevalent across the body um, and, and probably explains a lot of the symptoms, but you see it in the cardiomyocytes, you see it in vasculature, in the gut, 
um, of course, in the lungs. This is a review in the New England Journal from Wesley Cooper that was about myocarditis broadly, not specifically to viral. Um, and, and it's important for a few reasons, just addressing some of the, the testing that we utilize and their effectiveness of picking up myocarditis. So one, in, in this paper, that you know, myocarditis is commonly due to viral infections, but can result from other things, pathogens, toxic, or hypersensitivity drug reactions, giant cell myocarditis, or sarcoidosis. As we go forward, we're going to talk about a lot of the testing that's been done and a lot of the studies and recommendations for testing in athletes. And, and so I think this is an important piece to recognize. So in this paper, they, they suggested that troponin I was 89% specific, but only 34% sensitive to the diagnosis of myocarditis. The ECG, there's a variety of abnormalities, but really none of them are pathognomonic. Um, and, and you can see pretty much anything, low voltage, maybe suggested percortal fusions, Q waves, a new bundle branch block, two wave inversions, ST elevations, ST depressions. But again, the sensitive, sensitivity is quite low, you know, 47%. Um, with regards to the echocardiogram, it's, it's really helpful in ruling out other causes of heart failure, um, but there's really no specific features of acute myocarditis. Um, and, and in the population who's able to recover at home, uh, we have to remember that many of the cases actually do not show abnormal LV function. So what do we know about the cardiac outcome um, following COVID-19 in athletes? We really don't know yet. We're still learning. A lot of the initial data was, was, was very small scale, um, but I think over the next few months, we'll see some of the larger papers and one of them we will hit on today. Um, as I mentioned, the current return to play recommendations have been really focused on identifying myocarditis in this group. Uh, and myocarditis in general, as we discussed, can really lead to supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure, cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, and sudden cardiac death. So what about exercise in acute myocarditis? Why have, we, why have there been such extensive protocols and recommendations for testing athletes? And some of this initial data actually comes from a MIRI model of, of the Coxsackie virus uh, myocarditis in mice. And so they had 30 mice per group uh, and they had them swimming for 60 minutes for nine days. And what they found was that the infected, uh, infected mice who exercise ended up having increased viral titers, increased myocardial fibrosis and a higher mortality. So how does that translate to humans and what have we seen from our data? And so when we look back at all the studies ranging from, you know, this one on the right from 2004 all the way to the most recent one, um, 2018, that's here, in terms of the causes of sudden cardiac arrest or death in athletes. And so the one from the last is from Dr. Marin and, and, and colleagues in circulation in 2007. Um, this is one of the original papers suggesting that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was one of the big risk factors or cause of sudden death in athletes. But when you look at that arrow on the bottom left, that teal color, myocarditis was a 6% cause of sudden death in this group. When you look at, on the right, the um, paper from military recruits, here they had, uh, they looked back from 1977 to 2001, and they had 64 deaths that were uh, non-traumatic and identifiable, cardi identifiable cardiac abnormality. Uh, and they suggested that 13 or 20% of the deaths out of that 64 were related to myocarditis. More recently, uh, this is a paper from, from the group out of University of Washington in Seattle, that looked at sudden cardiac arrests and deaths in middle school, high school, college, and professional US athletes from 2014 to 2016. And they had 179 cases um, of either sudden cardiac arrests that were survived or deaths. And myocarditis was, was determined to be the cause of about 4.3%. So that had triggered a lot of the initial concern about when, when we saw the signal from hospitalized patients of increased injury and then knowing this background data on the cause of death in athletes. As we look forward and are going to review a lot of these papers that have been done, I wanted to just briefly touch base on how we were evaluating myocarditis before March 2020. And this was an interesting uh, review, actually, specifically for athletes that was published in February of 2020. Um, and so I'm going to zoom in here. And so this was in Jack. And what they looked at was the athlete with current or, or recent infection. If you go down to the right, if they had no cardiovascular symptoms, they were restricted until they recovered from their illness, and then they were returned to play gradually. And there was really no cardiac testing or screening done. Um, 
course, if the athlete had symptoms suggestive of cardiovascular disease, chest pain, palpitation, syncope, uh, exertional intolerance, it's all new. They went through testing that was included EKG, a lot of work looking for inflammatory markers, including troponin, um, an echocardiogram, and potentially stress test. Abnormalities from that initial testing usually triggered an MRI to further assess and look for myocarditis. So I think the highlight here is that if they didn't have cardiac symptoms, we weren't necessarily testing them to look for myocarditis. And, and the MRI was a sort of a, a secondary feature after we'd gone through uh, preliminary cardiac testing. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Weissman, for, for mentioning your, your talk coming up in two weeks. So I will let the MRI specs, uh, experts review all of this with you, but I think it's important to touch base on. So the Lake, Lake, Lake Louise criteria for myocarditis, um, when we look at all of these papers and, and look at the definition, I think it's important to get an understanding. So tissue edema, of course, is the hallmark of inflammation in all soft tissues. Um, it, the T1 and T2 relaxation times, they're magnetic properties of the tissue that's influenced by the intrinsic tissue characteristics, there's extrinsic environment, and the method of measurement. But with, with regards to cardiac MRI, the increased edema causes prolongation in both T1 and, and really especially in T2 relaxation times in the myocardium. The T1 is less specific. As you progress, the inflammation can also result in hyperemia, increased vascular permeability, and net expansion of the extracellular space. And then lastly, if it's more severe, inflammation can cause myocyte injury, necrosis, fibrosis, and scarring. And so for tissue edema, really T2 has been utilized. And for myocardial injury, you can look at the extracellular volume, native T1, and the late gadolinium enhancement. So this was an updated criteria that was published in 2018 in Jack, um, and it overused the use of MRI to diagnose myocarditis. So I think one of the first highlights here is to notice that even in that paper, they say that this, this criteria is really meant to be used in patients with clinically significant uh, syndrome that that's, uh, puts them at higher risk or higher pretest probability for having myocarditis. Um, when, when you look at the criteria, it really requires two pieces, one myocardial edema, uh, and then the second non-ischemic myocardial injury. Um, and, and it's suggested that if you if you have only one of the markers, it still may support the diagnosis if you have the appropriate clinical scenario. I think as you, as we review these studies and, and, and for those who read MRIs, obviously the MRI, MRI exper expertise is really required. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, techniques that are used and adjustments to help differentiate scar from artifact. Um, the parametric mapping that we've We've discussed a lot of it is, is newer, uh, and there's, there's no specific criteria for normal. And so there's a lot of pulse sequences, vendor-specific image acquisition and evaluation techniques that are really not standardized. And the normal reference range has been recommended that should be obtained from each local CMR program. Uh, and so there's really not a precise, precise cutoff for defining abnormal for any one of these parameters. And it's been recommended that you're using greater than two standard deviations above your local normal reference range. Um, so this was uh, a game plan for resumption of sport and exercise after coronavirus 2019 infection. This was a paper published um, in May of 2020 that by colleagues, sports cardiology colleagues around the country, gave that initial signal of harm and, and to make sure that the athletes were being evaluated appropriately um, before returning to play. So this was purely expert opinion, um, given we really had no data at the time. And so this is their work, their, their flow chart. And essentially, if the, obviously, if the patient was or the athlete was COVID negative and asymptomatic, they'd go through their normal pre-participation physical exam, which for most places is a history and physical examination. If they were positive for COVID-19, the, the initial algorithm suggested if they're asymptomatic, um, they would rest, recover, and then return to play gradually. Um, if they were mildly symptomatic, um, they'd rest, recover, have a, convalescence period, but then be evaluated by a medical professional uh, and consider high sensitivity troponin, 12 lead electrocardiogram, and a two-dimensional echocardiogram, and then more testing as, as dictated by those results. Now, I think it's important here, so these are the mild symptoms, which do not necessarily mean cardiac symptoms. Mild symptoms has been defined as sort of 
above the above the neck and GI. So rhinorrhea, cough, cold, um, some light myalgias, and then diarrhea. Um, and so they were considering this cardiac testing initially for that. Of course, hospitalized patients, um, we're not necessarily going to not touch upon here, but they, they would have their, their full cardiac testing, including EKGs, echoes, and troponins while hospitalized and then require follow-up. Many of you are going to be very familiar with this paper. Um, this is a paper out of Germany from Putman et al. that looked at uh, a non-athletic cohort, but um, the initial results were, were staggering and, and created a lot of stir and, and, and concern about myocardial injury after COVID-19 illness. So they looked at 100 PCR positive patients, 67 of them recovered at home, 18 were asymptomatic, and 49 were mild or moderately symptomatic. In the blue boxes, they're COVID-19 patients. They had some healthy controls and some risk factor mass controls as well. But the idea is that the age of this group was, was typically older than, than the competitive athlete group of 49, um, and they had risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, known CAD, smoking, and COPD asthma. With that said, though, the, the, the data suggested that 78% of them had abnormal cardiac MRI findings. Um, 36 had ongoing symptoms at the time of the MRI. But I think that the highlights here was that 32% showed late adrenal enhancement, 71% had abnormal T1 imaging, and 60% had ongoing inflammation or abnormal T2. And so they concluded that the cardiac pathology may develop among people with mild to moderate cases of COVID-19, and cardiac involvement occurs independent of the severity of original presentation and persists beyond the acute presentation. And there on the right-hand side, you can see time since diagnosis on the x-axis going all the way up to about 115 days with still seeing abnormalities in both the T1 and T2. Now, I think it's really important to acknowledge here that, that the, there was a lot of inconsistencies and concern about the data and the way it was presented, and it actually led to a subsequent publication of a revised manuscript. Um, there was use of inaccurate, inaccurate metrics using mean versus medians, inconsistencies in the reported data between the figures, um, and, and I know there was, there was long discussions on Twitter and, and other statisticians who reviewed this data in detail and were very concerned about how it's reported. And of course, anytime that a data is, or a manuscript revised for having inconsistencies, it makes you pause and think about the, the whole data acquisition and reporting. Shortly after that, there was a, a paper in specifically competitive collegiate athletes out of Ohio State. Um, and that they actually did EKG troponins, echocardiograms, and cardiac MRIs in all of their athletes. And so they used cardiac MRI as a screening tool. And they had 26 competitive athletes. MRIs were done anywhere from 11 to 52 days after the infection. So none of their athletes required hospitalization or specific treatment. 12 had mild symptoms, fever, dyspnea, myalgia, sore throat. 14 were asymptomatic. The preliminary cardiac testing, EKGs, troponins, and echocardiogram were normal in all of the athletes but they reported that 15% had MRIs consistent with myocarditis, where they had abnormal T2 and lake adrenaline enhancement. Two of them were asymptomatic and two had mild symptoms. Interestingly, they also reported that another eight or 31% had lake adrenaline enhancement, suggestive of prior myocardial injury. So 31% of young competitive athletes had abnormal scarring fibrosis, uh, and four percent, and fifteen percent, two asymptomatic, two mild symptomatic evidence of myocarditis. Um, this is this is their chart of all their athletes, so one through twenty-six, um, and, and some of their MRI data. First, they use a cutoff of uh, native T two of less than fifty-three milliseconds uh, as normal, and if you look, uh, the majority of these numbers, and these are all in milliseconds, are ranging from really around forty-eight to sixty. Um, and then the ones with myocarditis, one had a 55 T2 milliseconds, 158, 161, 163. Um, and then if you also look down at this chart, they had multiple who were right at that cutoff with 53 milliseconds. And so what this study concluded was that the emerging cardiac MRI data questioned those recent recommended publications of only using an ECG echo 
or mildly symptomatic or immune symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, athletes. And they suggested that cardiac MRI provides excellent risk stratification for the assessment of myocarditis and really suggesting that MRI maybe should be used as a screening tool for anyone that's had COVID-19. And so there, there's a lot of limitations with this study. Um, it was published as a research letter with really limited CMR data analysis. There's no control group, um, whether the athletes themselves were self-controlled with had MRI in the past, wasn't compared to other healthy athletes uh, and what their MRIs look like. And we actually, you know, we don't know what other athletes who've had viral illnesses and who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, what their MRIs look like. We've never tested those folks as well. Um, the other important piece here is that the Lake Louise criteria have, were meant, as we highlighted earlier, to evaluate those with suspected myocardial inflammation. So people with a very low, low pretest probability of myocarditis, um, it's unclear what this data really means. Um, there's also been some editorials and some commentaries reporting that there was concern about the T2 cutoff using the study uh, for abnormal, uh, given prior publications suggesting that that value for P3 was, was associated with a very low specificity. So as we go through it, you know, some more of these studies, obviously I think it's important to think about the, the sensitivity and specificity piece of all of this. And so uh, with, with the idea of, of not wanting to miss a myocarditis in, in young competitive, otherwise healthy people, was there a push sort of to, to, um, to decrease the sensitivity, or sorry, to decrease the specificity while increasing the sensitivity and shifting that curve to the left. Um, Around that time, there was a lot of headlines that also came through. A Red Sox pitcher who was diagnosed with heart ailment after COVID-19. Um, and then there was multiple concerns about starting, restarting sport as with, with cardiac problems as the primary concern. So at, at the heart of it, cardiac inflammation, next virus hurdle for college leaders, heart condition linked with COVID-19 fuels power five concern about season's variability. I think the, the one thing that colleagues who were in contact with many of these leagues and teams was that you know, the current, the, the main concern uh, should have been and, and is the spread of the virus among athletes and keeping them safe from getting the virus, but that the, the concern of a cardiac illness should not be the reason to cancel season. I'm going to highlight a few more studies uh, that have been done just so you see the spectrum of what's, what's been out there and, and the size and reporting of it. This is a cardiac MRI study looking at 26 Polish national team athletes, all Caucasian, mainly female. Um, and they all wonder what work, EKG and MRI. Uh, again, about 80% of them were asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. One was hospitalized for non-cardiac reason and had an abnormal chest CT, but normal cardiac workup. Um, and the EKG and Japonin were normal in all athletes. So they, met, they suggested that zero met acute myocarditis criteria. They did have nine... 19% or five athletes had subtle MRI abnormalities. What's interesting, one of them, it said, you know, looking back at the data may have actually represented myocarditis after the acute phase because it, the athlete had late gadolinium enhancement with pericardial fusion and moderate symptoms, but no inflammation by T2. Uh, and so T2 imaging is not perfect. And also um, if, the, if the MRI was done a few weeks after or a few months after, maybe that acute inflammation had resolved and this is still an athlete with myocarditis. Here's another study looking at 59 athletes, 63% female. They all underwent troponin, EKG, echo with strain and MRI. Almost all, uh, all of them were either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And they suggested that two or 3% had myocarditis and both were completely asymptomatic. And one had pericarditis, all with, all with normal troponins, EKGs, echo, including strain. Uh, one of the athletes developed symptoms and ended up having uh, an LVF that dropped to 45% on follow-up after cardiogram. The other important highlight from this study is that they suggested that there was a significant finding of RV insertion point plate gadolinium enhancement. And, and you can see that right at the right, um, where the RV inserts into the left ventricle. Uh, and this is a finding that we've seen in, in older long-term endurance athletes, but has never really been seen or reported in otherwise young, healthy, competitive athletes in, in the collegiate age group. Uh, but they found that this, this RLG was similar in both COVID positive athletes compared to their athlete, athletic controls. Um, and the table there included some of the, the data with the T2 imaging in their milliseconds. And so what they found on the first 
you have the COVID-19 positive athletes followed by healthy controls, followed by athletic controls. And so the p-values here are comparing the COVID-19 positive athletes to healthy controls. And so they found that the, the T2 elements were higher at every um, location, septum lateral, or, or basal and, and mid septum and lateral walls. However, comparing the COVID-19 athletes to athletic controls, they were similar other than that the mid septum. And so two points here, one, maybe athletes do have different findings or normal findings, or their definition of normal may be different compared to a non-athletic cohort, and really reinforcing the need of having better data and better defined normals for the MRI in athletic population. And then two, you know, what is the difference here between a statistically significant number and a clinically significant number of one to two milliseconds? This is a study from West Virginia University at 54 athletes, 85% of the male had an EKG troponin echo, and then 48 of those also had a cardiac MRI. Um, they defined an abnormal uh, echo as a strain less than 16%, question about their RV size or function, and an EF less than 50%. This is their flow chart. Uh, they had initially had 160 athletes. Um, and then here's their initial positive of 34 and their different types of testing that they had with the PCR or antibody positive, but initial 34, uh, and then other athletes who eventually while being monitored over time tested positive. So they had a total of 60 athletes who tested positive, um, six were excluded, and then so 54 went through their protocol. A few highlights from this study. So 30 were asymptomatic, 66 mild, 4% moderate. So I think one of the recurring themes we've seen is most of the young competitive athletes are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Um, I think this is the first study that it suggested there's multiple abnormalities in the EKG and echocardiogram. Most of the ones so far have had completely normal preliminary testing. One athlete with abnormal troponin, six with abnormal strain. Now it doesn't comment on if this also was with athletes who had a low EF or if these were athletes with normal ejection fractions were determined to have abnormal strain and then three with a small pericardial effusion. Now what's shocking, is very different to what we've seen so far, is that zero had myocarditis, but they suggested that 19 or 40% of these athletes had pericarditis. Again, mainly asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic, so making the diagnosis purely off of the MRI. This is a recent study looking at from the University of Wisconsin, um, where all of their COVID positive athletes had an ECG, troponin, echocardiogram, and MRI. Um, 145 athletes, again, most of them asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Uh, two of them, 1.4% had myocarditis on MRI. Both of them were re-imaged after one month. So what's interesting is the first one had, was an asymptomatic athlete who had an abnormal troponin, what they described as marked myopericarditis. The second one had mild to moderate symptoms for three days, uh, and had normal EKG, and then the, the follow-up MRI at one month actually showed completely normal MRI, and so all the findings are normalized. And then again, we find this signal here of 38 or 26 percent of these athletes had RV insertion point late catalytic enhancement. The most recent paper and the most robust paper was recently published and includes one of our MedStar colleagues, Dr. Tucker, uh, who's one of our primary care sports medicine physicians and the team doc for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and this was a paper looking at um, multiple a collaboration actually among many of our professional team, uh, leagues. So the Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, the NHL, NFL, WNBA, and the NBA. And these athletes all had troponins, EKGs, and echocardiograms regardless of their symptoms. It was if they had tested positive, they had this testing done. I think one of the important um, findings or, or limitations from this study was there was really no core lab. So there was not, the data was not reviewed by, by the authors, but it was, it was sort of collected and then summarized. So here's one of their, their data points. Looking at all the different leagues labeled up top and the total number of COVID positive athletes. So per league, so for the, the NBA, so whether it be WNBA, the, the NBA, um, Major League Soccer. And so they had a total of 789 athletes among those leagues who tested positive. 
about 41% were asymptomatic or had really minimal symptoms. And when you look at their cardiac testing, 0.8% had an abnormal troponin. Again, that was defined as 99 percentile or above. Um, an abnormal electrocardiogram, 1.3% uh, had that. Uh, and that was defined as uh, for the most recent international criteria of, of EKG interpretation for athletes. And then 2.5 were determined to have an abnormal echocardiogram. Uh, and that was defined as either decreased scopal one longitudinal strain, small pericardial fusion. Uh, some of them had an ejection fraction of 53%, impaired uh, LV relaxation, dilated right ventricle, or PVCs. And so similar, really no athlete had severe illnesses and none of them were hospitalized. Um, out of that initial group of 789, um, 30 or 3.8% were sent for more testing and 27 had cardiac MRIs. They had noted three had myocarditis and MRI, 0.4% of the whole cohort, and two had pericarditis or 0.3% of the total cohort. All these athletes that competed finished their seasons and there was no cardiac events. Um, and what they suggested was that the EKG provided very low specificity for the detection of subclinical inflammatory heart disease. The established 99th percentile for the troponin does not include elite athletes. So while we use that as a cutoff for abnormal, we don't have really the normative data on elite athletes with this, with this new assay. Um, and they suggested that the abnormal echocardiogram is probably the best predictor for, for uh, myocarditis. And then I think the important, again, probably one of the most important pieces here is that the five athletes with inflammatory heart disease, so either myocarditis or pericarditis, had at least moderate symptoms. And the moderate symptoms would have included some chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, persistent fevers or persistent myalgias or fatigue. So um, this would have been a group who probably would have triggered cardiac testing if it wasn't already um, part, you know, been uh, required as part of their screening. I tried to summarize the studies here so we can just take a quick look at them in, in aggregate. And so that the author names are on the left, the two highlighted ones I didn't specifically address um, individually, but we'll review that quickly. Um, and so all of them were based on athletes except that first one from Puntman et al. Uh, and then you have your mean ages and your total number of uh, patients. So the Puntman et al, they didn't really declare myocarditis. So I have it italicized there that you 60% that had edema. Um, and then 22% that had pericardial enhancement, but they didn't say pericarditis. Um, so they had 60% abnormal ongoing edema. The Ohio State study with the 15%. But then after that, most of the studies really don't show much myocarditis. It's 0.7% out of 145 athletes. The, the one I didn't mention looked at uh, 20, 12 athletes that were compared to 15 athlete controls, and then 15 athlete controls and 15 controls. Uh, and there's no myocarditis in that group. Uh, the, the next study that had 54 athletes, zero myocarditis, um, and then the NFL study of 0.4%. You look at pericarditis, there's really the, the highest signal comes from the, the one study that suggested 40% pericarditis, but all the other ones have been pretty low, uh, including the largest one from the NFL of 0.3%, sorry, not the NFL, the professional league, 0.3%. And then I think the next important piece is what, how, how was the MRI determined to be used? Was it a screening test or was it symptom-based? And almost all of them, the MRI was used as a, as a standard screening for anyone that tested positive. Um, this one study here, bolded, is, is actually an Italian study. And, and the Italians require a uh, significant cardiac workup before sport. So they actually had baseline EKGs, echoes, stress tests, uh, on, on their athletes, and so this was done on 18 athletes, and they had uh, 15 of the athletes acted as their own controls from, from pre-COVID data. Um, and they ended up looking at significant all the blood work, uh, troponins, D-dimers, um, EKG, stress tests with pulse oximeter, Holter monitors, spirometry, chest CT, and an echocardiogram. And they suggested that none of them had abnormalities, um, including 15 of those 18 who were able to compare to their own data. Uh, and they had none of the short-term uh, issues. Um, and then none of them had outcomes data other than the most recent professional league data that suggested there was no adverse events. Um, 
colleagues who wrote the initial return to play recommendations in May updated their recommendations based on sort of their own anecdotal experience from around the country, what we'd all been seeing, which was luckily not a lot of myocarditis. Um, and so this was published in October back in, uh, again in JAMA Cardiology. Uh, and they had changed it up a bit. And so essentially asymptomatic athletes were positive, um, did not require any testing. They went through their self-isolation. And I think the key piece here is a slow, gradual return to play. And, and during that process, you know, gradually returning, if they develop symptoms, then they would be um, put back into sort of the cycle of not needing cardiac testing. Athletes who had mild symptoms, again, above the neck and GI, uh, would self-isolate and, and cardiovascular testing, testing was not necessary, but considered for people with either a protracted course of illness or after a shared decision-making conversation was still, you know, are unknowns if the patient or family requested or, or, or really wanted to have the cardiac testing. Um, and then those with moderate symptoms, chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, presyncope, syncope, palpitations, they were required to have the EKG, troponin, and echocardiogram. But again, MRI was never part of the initial screening process. The, this is a similar algorithm, but this was for master's athletes, um, where the testing was really not required for people with moderate symptoms. It was, you can consider the cardiac testing. But otherwise, really, the, the slow, gradual return to play was probably the most important part, part of this. Given all the testing that's been done uh, with the recommendations of EKG, troponin, and echocardiogram, um, there, there was a nice paper published in, in Jack Imaging that was reviewing some of the images, imaging considerations for the athlete. And of course, it can be a challenge to diagnose acute myocarditis and differentiate this from athlete's heart we're exercise induced cardiac remodeling. Um, and you know, it, it's tough without many of the data points to decide what the best screening method is. We, we don't know yet really the true prevalence of, of COVID-19 related cardiac injury in athletes. And we don't know the diagnostic performance of the testing modalities. So a, a lot of limitations. But with that said, here's a review of some of, some of the data that's been recommended. So for the electrocardiogram, over 70% of athletes have repolarization abnormalities that can be confused with myopericarditis. So on the left, you have diffuse SC segment elevation, but this is an asymptomatic, normal, healthy athlete with early repolarization. On the right, you have SC elevation and, and very subtle PR depression that's noted in that, with the red arrow. But again, the clinical history really helps you here. This is a patient or an athlete with peritic chest pain um, after the illness that really helps push the diagnosis. The troponin, so the, the high sensitivity assay has been recommended when available. Um, obviously that test is not available anywhere, so the troponin I or troponin T. Um, we've actually had some issues where the, the, the insurance or the lab will, will change. So if we order troponin I, we'll get back a troponin T result. Um, important facts to remember here that after strenuous exercise, it's really not uncommon to see an elevated troponin. And um, so the kinetics tend to be different than for actual injury and, and the troponins tend to normalize 24 to 48 hours after exercise. Um, again, the 99 percentile is recommended, but we don't have really established reference ranges. Um, and a troponin that's detectable, but technically normal and under, under that 99 percentile may not exclude the presence of myocardial injury. Uh, and so given this, the troponin results should really be considered in combination with the rest of the testing and the symptoms of the athlete. What about the echocardiogram? So uh, from data from non-COVID myocarditis, um, the echocardiogram, we can see, you can see a mimicking of, of dilated hypertrophic from the edema and restrictive cardiomyopathies. Um, you can have global or regional LV dysfunction with or without uh, diastolic dysfunction. Uh, and with a preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, the initial COVID-19 related cardiac abnormalities primarily came from hospitalized patients. Uh, and many of them had um, preserved systolic ejection fractions. Uh, and the, the highest signal of, of abnormality was actually RV, right ventricular systolic dysfunction, um, and LV diastolic dysfunction. And so I think when, when we are looking at the echocardiograms of all these athletes having the testing done, we have to keep that in mind, but also understand what we expect to see from the athlete and him or herself with the idea of that the magnitude of, of the exercise induced cardiac remodeling and the adaptation is really influenced by the athlete's age, sex, BSA, ethnicity, 
their exercise dose and their sport. And so if you have uh, a 24 year old professional African-American basketball player who's 6'9", 250 pounds, I'm gonna expect to see something very different than a Caucasian female runner who's 20 um, based on this data. They've put together um, considerations uh, for what, you know, what would be considered athletic remodeling versus some of the red flags that should be suspicious for pathology and probably trigger more workup. Um, and so for the athletic remodeling, a uh, few highlights in the boxes, um, we expect to see for endurance athletes symmetric dilation of all four cardiac chambers. And so for athletes who are doing 10, 15, 20 hours a week of, of, of cycling, swimming, running, um, that's a sustained increase in their cardiac output that is, that is seen and, and uh, maintained by all four cardiac chambers. And so isolated dilation left ventricle would be abnormal. You'd expect to see all four chambers dilated because they've all handled a high cardiac output in that load. Um, we never expect to see regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, typically, the norm is supranormal tissue Doppler myocardial velocities, the septal and lateral E primes are, are supranormal, not uncommon to see septals 15, 20, and laterals 20, 25. Um, and then global longitudinal strain can be tricky in athletes. There's been reports all over the board. Um, and so from this paper, it's recommended that a strain of less than 16% be considered as abnormal. I will tell you that there's been studies done on healthy Olympic athletes that have, have had strains less than 16. So it should not be used in isolation. Um, but I think if you see an athlete that is not an endurance athlete, with a reduced ejection fraction, with a low strain, maybe that signals ab abnormal. Um, the red flags for the left ventricle. So again, any segmental wall motion abnormality, asymmetric regional wall thickening is not normal. And then really the truth is that most athletes, um, unless they're really endurance elite athletes have an EF greater than 50%. So an uh, EF of 50% should be, or lower than 50% uh, should be at least considered to be abnormal with potentially further investigation. For the right ventricle, um, you know, we expect to see the coordinated and consistent regional wall motion and deformation, and you typically have normal or low normal systolic function. One of the things that we've learned for, for competitive athletes is that um, size cutoffs are not very helpful. Many of them have uh, large right ventricles, and I think the key piece is symmetry here. Um, and so they've suggested that uh, if you measure the RV to LV basal end diameter, um, that a ratio greater than one should be triggered as abnormal. When should we be considering a cardiac MRI? Um, so again, this is this, this they, they mention a few things here, and this is really the, the piece of those with moderate to high pre probability of myocarditis should then be pursuing a cardiac MRI. So if someone's having cardiopulmonary symptoms after the COVID-19 infection, even if they've had a normal echocardiogram, I would consider a cardiac MRI. Uh, troponins, so if they had initial troponin, but they happen to exercise beforehand, you have them uh, abstain for any exercise 48 hours if their second troponin is still abnormal. At that point, it would be unexplained and you can consider an MRI. Um, and then you can go down to the list, many of these we've mentioned already. You know, as we've reviewed some of this data and some of the studies, there's still a lot of unknowns. You know, many of the subtle abnormalities that were found or reported were in athletes who had had normal ECGs, troponins, and echocardiograms, were asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. So, are, are these isolated MRI findings clinically significant in this group of people? And, and I touch on that one Wisconsin study that had the resolution of myocarditis in one month follow up. So, you know, again, we don't know what the MRI looks like after other viral illnesses. Are these, are these initial findings common after a viral illness? They're not clinically significant and resolve after a short time. Um, I think that's certainly an area that needs to be explored. The other highlight that's come up is that a few studies have suggested a very high prevalence of this RV insertion point weight gain and enhancement in young athletes. That definitely needs to be further explored. It's really only been considered to be long-term endurance athletes who put on a persistent volume load uh, and strain on the right ventricle. And it's, it's been thought to be benign because it hasn't been associated with any adverse outcomes, but certainly more needs to be done in this younger group. I will touch on, but don't want to get too far into the long haulers, but uh, this has been in, in both 
previously healthy active athletes uh, and also uh, non non athletic cohort. Uh, but these are people who've had symptoms that last for weeks to months after recovery from the acute illness, um, including those who have mild disease and able to were able to recover at home. Um, and it, the data is not great, but initial estimates suggest at least about 10% of people who've had uh, COVID-19 um, are long callers. And they include symptoms of persistent fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain, heart racing, brain fog. And a lot of the objective data has been normal um, on the initial testing. There's the NIH proposed name, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and again, some initial proposed criteria is that, you know, having a diagnosis or diagnosed COVID-19 they're still not at their COVID, pre-COVID baseline after six months after the infection, um, and their symptoms are suggestive of long COVID, but they don't have any real objective evidence of permanent damage um, to explain their symptoms. Um, there's been some conversations with Dr. Fauci and some other literature that's suggesting it may be similar to chronic fatigue syndrome or autonomic dysregulation. Um, I think the one thing that we should definitely focus on is there's, there's a very large component of severe deconditioning um, people aren't used to being in, a, in either a small bedroom or dorm room for 10 days with very little movement or activity. Um, and so there, I think there's, a, there's an associated severe deconditioning that acts like a POTS-like syndrome, um, but uh, it should be cautious to diagnose them unless they've had these sort of persistent symptoms after months. So, in summary, uh, myocarditis in general has, has been noted to be a common cause of sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death in athletes. Uh, the prevalence of cardiac related pathology after COVID-19 in competitive athletes is likely low, but it's definitely under, remains under investigation and we need larger studies to help corroborate that. Um, knowledge of the expected findings of athlete's heart based on the, the athlete's characteristics, um, sport, hours per week of training, BSA, sex, uh, can be very helpful to differentiate healthy versus pathologic findings on their cardiac testing. Uh, we reviewed, I think, all of the current studies that have been done, and there's clearly large inconsistencies with both the prevalence of myocarditis versus pericarditis. Um, and so this emphasizes the need for larger multi-center data controls and then blinded assessments with reproducibility in the findings. Uh, we still need to determine the best practices for cardiac testing prior return to play. And, and we need, you know, once we have a better idea of both the prevalence of the disease and, and the, um, how good the testing is in picking up disease, we probably make better informed decisions with that. I think regardless of any, any cardiac testing, even if we did cardiac MRIs in everyone, the two important pieces here are gradual return to play because in that process, athlete might develop symptoms that are then we're able to stop them again and pursue any further work at the testing that's needed. Um, and a well-developed well and rehearsed emergency action plan remains critical. Having AEDs, having the physicians, athletic trainers available and aware is, is the most important piece because regardless of what we do in this scenario or other scenarios with competitive athletes or young healthy athletes, um, cardiac arrest is inevitable. And so being prepared is going to be very important. We still don't have the long-term outcomes, but it seems that the short-term outcomes are probably pretty good. Um, and, and use of cardiac MRIs as screening tool has many challenges and for now really should be only used when, when clinically indicated. I will pause there. Uh, thank you, Ankit. That was really a, a great review and a lot of data. And uh, I always enjoy any talk where cardiac MRI is sort of the center <laughs> of conversation, but uh, uh, it's open to discussion. Um, so, uh, Gabby, I'll start off if it's okay. Anka, um, great, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Learned, learned a lot. You um, uh, sort of just barely touched on the the uh, issues of of uh, long term out outcomes and risk of of, of sudden death. Um, is there no literature at at all on on um, on on incidents of sudden death? Are are there any any case reports of athletes returning to act activity and suffering cardiac death? sudden death after after acute COVID? Not that I know of. There was a, a scare in December, and this is all uh, publicly available, but there was a scare in December. It was all over the news about a basketball player from Florida who had a cardiac arrest and had a COVID illness three months prior and initially attributed to COVID-19 uh, pathology 
but um, they then released some updated stuff in ESPN and other places in February, suggesting that he had met with call or experts around the country and they said this was not COVID-19 related and he had some other pathology. So I, I do not know of a sudden cardiac death or arrest. And actually it's, it's funny for anyone that knows Dr. Paul Thompson in Connecticut, he had written, uh, he has written something about this, essentially saying, where are all the bodies? If, if, we, if the prevalence of myocarditis is so high and the risk of sudden death is so high, why have we not seen more cardiac arrest or cardiac sudden deaths? Thanks. Um, Ron, I see you've uh, turned on your video. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ankit, for a nice uh, review. So a couple of questions. One, if you can elaborate a little bit about the mechanism, how much of this you can attribute to inflammation and how much to microvascular thrombosis? Uh, and the second one, I mean, from everything that you gathered, we're dealing with uh, relatively young individuals and we know that the manifestation of COVID-19 in the young is a little bit different. Many of them actually remains almost asymptomatic. And I know that the athletes are subjected to a lot of testing, but what is the likelihood that this whole uh, syndrome or even myocarditis is gonna run on those athletes and they would not even notice that or they would not feel anything out of this. We're talking about people with relatively low troponin, um, lingering myocarditis, but not something that would you know, these are strong people. I mean, you see them playing basketball every every other day or every day. Uh, you wonder, I mean, how many of those are working with asymptomatic myocarditis? Because you're not running those tests. So I'm, any comments on those two things? First on the mechanism, any data, what's differentiating the young versus the known in the elderly, and also about the silent myocarditis in athletes. Yeah, two great questions. I mean, I think we're, we're all still learning about the, the exact mechanisms of injury. Um, I think for, for the athletes, it's been concern of direct viral myocyte invasion um, and, and actual myocarditis. But um, I think we're still learning that piece. With regards to the asymptomatic carrier or asymptomatic people with myocarditis, I think you've hit the question and that's really the truth. And, and the thing is, we, we, we don't know any of the data after the influenza virus. We don't know anything after any of the common colds and viruses that everyone has. We are not doing MRIs on asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic athletes. So all this initial data that potentially is concerning, we don't know what the outcomes are. Uh, and that's why I highlighted that one case where a month later, the MRI was normal. So this was an uh, asymptomatic athlete who had initial abnormal, abnormal MRI findings a month later was normal. So how often does that happen? Is that at all clinically relevant? So that's the question. I think that's also one of the important reasons why it's recommended that MRIs not be done unless they're clinically, you know, a higher pretest probability of having myocarditis where the athlete has persistent symptoms or concerns. Um, and in that respect, um, we're, we're following the published sort of algorithm of, of waiting three to six months before return to play and repeating testing um, based on really that initial sort of um, Miri model suggesting that exercise and acute myocarditis increases the viral proliferation and, and scarring and sudden death. Um, but still a lot of unknowns. Maybe I'll add one provocative question kind of comment. Um, when you see they playing, there is no social justice. You see it in football players, you see that in basketball. And so we have a lot of contact uh, more than what we see on a normal face person to person contact. I understand that they are testing and they are negative, but is that means that you can extrapolate that if you have a negative test, the same protocol that applies to the athletes, you don't have to keep the social uh, this, uh, distancing because I mean, they don't keep any social, uh, any, any distancing, right? I mean, they don't wearing masks, they sweating, they touching it to each other. They, I mean, and there is experience right now. We we finished the football uh, season very successfully. Uh, I'm kind of puzzled. I mean, we're getting so much restriction as a non-athletes, and here you have an individuals, and, and we can continue to get those restrictions after we got vaccinated, and here you have athletes that they are basically get a different uh, standard of. Uh, um, rules set by, I don't know, by whoever set the rules. Uh, so how do you feel uh, 
uh, how can you justify that? Or maybe we should all be like, at least if you tested negative, we can all don't have to keep the social, the, the, the distancing and the masking and all this. What's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, those protocols were, were defined by, you know, infectious disease specialists and they've consulted them and they have them on their panels um, and, and they're being tested daily as you suggested. So daily negative tests and then they have their quarantine protocols and their assessments and they've created bubbles in, in different ways. Um, and so that's not really uh, feasible for many of us uh, or, or many other sort of vocations. But um, I, I would defer to the ID specialist to really <laughs> determine those protocols. Steve Epstein. Yeah, on Keith, a beautiful, beautiful talk and summary. I, I also learned a lot. I, I'd like to point out two uh, issues and raise those uh, questions. The original report, which you point, uh, pointed out, have, has enormous flaws. And uh, the, I, I didn't realize that the paper was resubmitted with uh, corrections. But you know that incidence of myocarditis of 60% or something like that was astounding and undoubtedly uh, a major overestimation. Uh, but I, I do have to point out that all of the other studies you summarized, uh, I mean, you're interested in competitive athletes. So, uh, of course, they were uh, involving individuals who are far younger. So the average age in that original study was 49 years. And all of your studies involved uh, individuals who are 25 or less. And as Ron pointed out, uh, COVID-19 is really a different disease in older individuals and younger individuals. So um, I think one has to be very careful uh, talking about myocarditis as it may occur in young individuals versus myocarditis as it may occur in older individuals. The other important thing that I can't um, find in most of the published studies, and you didn't have it in your uh, charts, but I think it would be important to have in that, is that the original study had an MRI follow-up of 71 days, almost two and a half, not a follow-up, but it, an initial MRI study late where they made the diagnosis of myocarditis, where I think most of your studies had MRIs relatively early post-COVID. My own feeling about the myocarditis is that uh, although there may be acute viral-induced damage, direct viral-induced damage to the myocardium, I think the chances are overwhelmingly high that if myocarditis occurs, it's probably going to be more frequently an autoimmune response. And that would necessarily be uh, a, a later response than would occur with the acute viral damage to the myocardium. So I, I think that uh, the time of testing for MRI, uh, one has to be aware of an acute illness uh, and the long haul uh, uh, COVID. And I, I, what your uh, summary, I think, did not test just because of the population you were interested in is long haul incidence of myocarditis and also the potential of myocarditis occurring more frequently in an older population. So that was a long comment, but I, I was hoping you could make some uh, comment about my comments. That was a great presentation, thank you. Thank you very much. I think both points are very well taken. Um, the, the concern of this long haul myocarditis, you know, at a certain point, if the athlete has, has now been returned to play fully asymptomatic and having no clinical symptoms, um, we haven't, you know, in other viral illnesses, we have not persistently tested them or looked for cardiovascular pathology or disease. Because at that point, we don't really know what to do with that information. We then restrict them three months later and say, now you have myocarditis after you played for two months. Um, I think it would just become uh, more of a dilemma, especially if clinically they're doing well. Um, with regards to the, the comparison, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that the, the age, age difference is, is an important piece here. Um, but given a lot of the resources and a lot of this testing has been focused on a young competitive group, um, you know, and, and you know, the, old, the concerns about cardiac screening in athletes, there's been you know, years of ongoing controversy over ECGs. 
And all of a sudden, the last year, we've now ad added a troponin, echo, and cardiac MRI to that piece. Uh, and we don't even really have defined normals for an MRI. So all the concerns of costs, um, you know, inappropriate disqualification, overdiagnosing, misdiagnosing. So I think the goal here is to try to get uh, enough of a data set to, to help guide what testing we should be doing, if any, um, ultimately for people who've had a COVID illness. Right. No, I'm not questioning the competitive athletes. I think you really hit the nail on the head with them. I'm just suggesting that we can't extrapolate the findings of normal athletes into an older age uh, population. 100% agree with that. Absolutely. Thanks, Stephen. I'll use your comment as a shameless plug again for two weeks from now. Um, Ariana Fontana and Dan Knight will present their data from London, which is in an older population um, and shows um, a, lot, a lot of the challenges of how to deal with that. And, and I will also mention that MedStar here with Neil Wiseman and Federico Ash, we have two experts in all the challenges of properly interpreting uh, clinical data uh, correctly for the purposes of making these types of uh, assessments from imaging and all the pitfalls that, that are involved in using uh, you know, clinical imaging data and how to do it correctly. Um, Alan, I, I see you're off uh, video I or on video. I assume you wanted to make a comment. Oh, no, just thank you, Mike. I really enjoyed it. I think um, you know, the one thing we're seeing, and in in I think is some of the younger referrals, on some, you know, like the high school athlete who is not a super competitive, you know, not performing at a, you know, a professional level, exertion levels. Well. They're also the younger patients that tend to do well. And where are we with them in terms of uh, post-COVID screening? It sounds like even further minimizing what we're doing there as long as they're feeling well would be a return to play gradually as long as they're free of symptoms. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, so that, that last JAMA cardiology paper had tried to sort of uh, make some, some age brackets and they'd suggested the 15 and younger um, have a, more of a gradual return to play because they're much, much, much less like, uh, likely of having issues, but they group 16 and above uh, as competitive athletes in the same cohort. So as a way of just being standardized in our approach, I've been doing the same for, for, for anyone in that group. Um, the, the thing that's also, I guess, come, come across clearly is that a lot of different high schools, universities have created their own protocols. Mm -hmm. And so they will just do a troponin or just do an EKG and require that for that athlete before we're into return to play without fully understanding that independently one of those things is not the best predictor of, of, of you know, again, a negative troponin or negative ECG as we've discussed doesn't necessarily shouldn't be very reassuring. Um, so uh, that's, that, that's certainly been a challenge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you, I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, Gabby, if I may, I just want to throw one more thought about the mechanism because I think that's really important. Uh, we see a lot of patients with myocarditis and it's like a big package, but yeah, we differentiate between the young and the old, that's easy. But I think also we have to make effort to differentiate between COVID related to non COVID related, because on the COVID related, we can have something which is microthrombus versus inflammation. And therefore, the treatment may be different. So there is at least, it, it is a COVID related micro, which I'm not aware about it for the non COVID related myocarditis, it's usually either viral or autoimmune. But here you have another mechanism that there would be any reason to believe that it's a microthrombotic event, which was described in autopsies. It's not like just making it. And you can maybe relate to that if you have any other evidence of VTE in the patient elsewhere, or maybe the D dimers, or uh, then I think you should differentiate also treatment on those patients, even if they're in the young, because we do see young individuals also with sometimes severe myocarditis and then give them steroids, there's nothing to do with that if this is microtrombi. So I think that effort to nail the diagnosis or the mechanism is extremely important. Agreed. I think the dimer can be helpful. Uh, if, if I can, uh, this is Federico, if I can make a short comment. Um, the, I think we have to be careful on what we're calling myocarditis. One thing is to get an MRI, you know, stamp, with the typical images, but having troponin by no means in these patients means means having myocarditis. Uh, in in our study, in the waste COVID study, we enrolled 870 patients, and I can tell you 
that 94% of all the patients, these were admitted to the hospital um, with COVID, 94% of all the patients had abnormal troponin. And the enormous majority of them had a normal ejection fraction, a normal strain of the LV and the RV. So, you know, we, we have to be a little bit skeptical. We need to understand this is a, a, an inflammatory disease that is systemic. Uh, there may be multiple other reasons why troponin go up or BMP goes up or, or CRP goes up. That is not necessarily myocarditis. Uh, the, the other sort of side comment to Juan's comment, uh, inflammation does lead to a prothrombotic state. So it could be that the underlying mechanism leading to thrombosis is the same as the inflammation induced whatever other uh, target organ you're considering. Thanks, everybody. That was really a, a brilliant talk, Ankit, and thanks so much for, um, for giving us the latest updates um, on this talk. I'll, I'll sort of mention that um, we're actively trying to get involved in a few trials um, in NIH submissions as well as local trials for um, uh, patients post-COVID here. Uh, we have a, a large enough population, certainly. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of data to come. And talking to, to some of my radiology colleagues in Europe, I was just speaking to somebody in Milan a few days ago, which was the center of activity at the very beginning of COVID. And they're having, unfortunately, yet one more wave. They're certainly seeing long-term effects in people, both pulmonary and they think cardiac. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot more uh, data to, to come out. Uh, thanks, everybody. We'll see everybody uh, next week. Thank you.